Welcome back to Old School LPs. We're playing Dragon Age Origins again today. We're going to be getting into Redcliffe Castle, trying to find Arl Eamon. But first, like always, some lore. The Corpse. To anyone who doubts the wickedness of blood. <laughs> so-called Usurper King of Ferelden. Be that as it may, the High Dragon's Rampage turned toward the Orlesian side of the Frostback Mountains, killing hundreds and sending thousands more fleeing to the northern coast. The Ferelden rebels won the Battle of Riverdane, ultimately securing their independence. Many thus think that the Dragon Age will come to represent a time of violent and dramatic change for all of Thetis. It remains to be seen. From the Studious Theologian by Brother Genetivi, Chantry Scholar, 925 Dragon. The Noble Families of Ferelden. 
The occupation left empty castles in its wake. Whole families were butchered in the initial invasion, and all those who couldn't or wouldn't bend knee to the emperor's puppet king were declared traitors and hunted. Many bloodlines ended on Chevalier's blades at dusty crossroads, in forest clearings, or in freeholds. And then there were the turncoats. To curry favor with their new masters, some nobles took up arms against their brothers. They betrayed and murdered the rebel queen, an act that created even more vacant titles and lands once King Merrick exacted justice. That Ferelden did not fall apart after the Orlesians left is a testament to the strength of King Merrick. The old families still held grudges against those who had sided with the Emperor, and those new families that had been granted titles were viewed as interlopers. The lands meets that followed Merrick's coronation were tense, to say the least. From Ferelden, Folklore and History, by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. And it looks like we've had an update to Alistair's entry. Makes sense after hearing about his lineage in a previous episode. So here is Alistair. You know, one good thing about the Blight is how it brings people together. Alistair was a novice Templar when Duncan recruited him into the Grey Wardens, or rescued him, as Alistair would say. His mother was a serving girl who died when Alistair was very young. He was raised by Eamon Garin, Arl of Redcliffe, for a time. The Arl's wife, Isolde, suspected the reason her husband took an interest in the welfare of a servant's child was that Alistair was Eamon's son. She insisted that the boy be sent away to the Chantry. Isolde's suspicions were unfounded, however. Alistair was not Eamon's son, but King Merrick's. Eamon sheltered the boy to hide his existence from Queen Rowan, Eamon's sister. Alistair is fascinated by magic, even as his life is defined by fighting its darker manifestations. He has a fondness for strange runestones and figural studies of arcane creatures. That should do for lore for now. Let's see what's in this castle. Is there anyone alive out there? Wait, you don't look like the Arlesser's guards. Are you from outside the castle? Possibly. Who are you supposed to be? My name is Jowan. I'm a mage Lady Isolde hired to tutor her son, Connor. Until they, uh, threw me into the dungeon here. You're the one who poisoned the Arl. I'm not proud of it. The Arlesa had no idea what I was hired to do when she took me in to tutor Connor. I... I know it looks suspicious, but I'm not responsible for the creatures and the killings in the castle. I was already imprisoned when all that began. At first, Lady Isolde came here with her men, demanding that I reverse what I'd done. I thought she meant my poisoning of the Arl. That's the first I heard about the walking corpses. She thought I'd summoned a demon to torment her family and destroy Redcliffe. She had me tortured. There was nothing I could do or say that would appease her. So they left me to rot. Why did you poison Arl Eamon? I was instructed to by Terran Loghain. I was told that Arl Eamon was a threat to Ferelden, that if I dealt with him, Loghain would settle matters with the Circle. You see, I'm a Malifica, a blood mage. You, a blood mage? Truly? I would never have guessed. A blood mage? Well, that isn't good. I dabbled in the Forbidden Arts, and they condemned me to death for it. I thought Loghain was giving me a chance to redeem myself. But he's abandoned me here, hasn't he? Everything's fallen apart, and I'm responsible! I have to make it right somehow. I have to! Why is Arl Eamon a threat, exactly? He only said that Arl Eamon was dangerous to the nation. Why wouldn't I believe Terran Loghain? So Terran Loghain himself hired you? Yes. 
When the Templars caught me, they brought me to Denerim to await execution. Eventually, someone came to see me, alone. It was the Terran. I'd seen paintings of him, so I knew. I thought he'd have me executed right there. But he said I could make up for my crime. He said I would be helping the country. Why are you so eager to make things right? I'm not allowed regrets? I've made a stupid mistake at the Circle, and now I've made an even greater one. I'm... not a bad person. There's no reason for you to believe me, but I'm not. I have to make up for what I've done. I have to try. But why did the Arlesa need a mage to tutor her son? Connor had started to show... signs. Lady Isold was terrified the circle of magi would take him away for training. Connor? A mage? I can't believe it. She sought an apostate, a mage outside the circle, to teach her son in secret so he could learn to hide his talent. Her husband had no idea. Arl Eamon had no idea of his son's abilities. No, she was adamant that he never find out. She said that he'd do the right thing, even if it meant losing their son, and that infuriated her. How much magic did you teach, Connor? Some, but he's still very young. He can barely cast a minor spell, never mind something more powerful. At least not intentionally. I have thought about it, and it's possible Connor could have inadvertently done something to tear open the veil. With the veil to the Fade torn, spirits and demons could infiltrate the castle. Powerful ones could kill and create those walking corpses. Character-wise, I would already know the answer to this question, but for lore purposes, I will go ahead and ask, why would Isolde be frightened of her son becoming a mage? Because he would be taken away forever. A mage cannot inherit a title, even the son of a powerful Arl. She's also a pious woman. Her son having magic was humiliating. I see. I think I understand. I never meant for it to end like this. I swear. Let me help you fix this. I say this boy could still be of use to us, but if not, then let him go. Why keep him prisoner here? Hey, hey, let's not forget he's a blood mage. You can't just set a blood mage free. Better to slay him. Better to punish him for his choices. Is this Alistair who speaks, or the Templar? I'd say it's common sense. We don't even know the whole story yet. He wishes to redeem himself. Doesn't everyone deserve that chance? Like yourself, you mean? Everyone deserves a chance to redeem themselves in the Maker's eyes. This man, no less than any. I don't know. He is a blood mage. But this is an unusual situation. Give me a chance, please. So how will you make things right? I... well, I try to save anyone still up there. There must be something I can do. So if I were to just let you go? I'd stay and try to help if I could. Perhaps I can help deal with whatever's been unleashed here. And after that, what happens? Afterwards, I assume I'll be arrested, or executed, or whatever people like me get. I'm tired of running from the Circle. I need to account for what I've done. That's commendable, if it's true. I'm glad you think so. So what now? I'm letting you out of your cell. Don't. Try. Anything. You're letting me out? And what then? You come with me, that's what. I'm not sure that's a good idea. I'd like to help out, but I'm not so sure I want to follow you into danger, exactly. I I'm tempted to tell him to suck it up. But I'll be a little nicer than that. Then help. Just don't make things worse. I won't, I promise. I will find a way to fix this somehow. Make sure we haven't missed some items in here. Oh, nice, a pile of filth. Okay. 
and note. A rolled up note. Ooh, this is long. I hope whoever finds this can read it. I hate the thought that my last words might be used as kindling or make or forbid to wipe someone's bum, but that's happenstance for you, I suppose. My name is Brannon. I was born in Renisphere. I grew apples once upon a time. When the Orlesians came to demand I bow to their emperor, I turned them away. They set fire to my orchards, to my house too, but I didn't care. I stood and watched them burn. Trees die eventually, houses fall, but my honor can be lost only if I let it. They came back a week later and demanded that I swear an oath. This time, when I refused, they clapped me in irons. Now I'm here and I'll die in this place. It seems a foolish thing to die for, doesn't it? I could have said a few words and rebuilt my home, gone on with my life as if nothing had changed. A hundred generations of my family have lived and died on that land, and I won't be the one to trade our family honor for apples. Whoever you are, whatever they've brought you here for, if you leave this place, I hope you go to Renisphere. There's no living remnant of us left there, but you'll find my family all the same. We're stamped onto the earth. We're in the wind that rustles the trees. Tell my family how I died, and I promise you, they'll hear. Brennan. Oof, that is suitably depressing. Time to head upstairs. Going. Oh, there's the demons. Thankfully, we seem to be doing well enough in combat so far. Guys. Oh, and Leliana needs to heal up 
Take that, Liliana. I'll do one too. Oh, wow. That took down Alistair and Liliana really fast. I was not watching carefully enough. I think we have plenty of injury kits, so hopefully that won't be an issue. Doge was getting pretty close to dead as well. All right, Let's see with the damage. Alistair has a penalty to cunning. Doesn't really matter. Liliana has a penalty to damage. We will not be having that. Liliana should be better now. And she is. Let's level up more again while we're here. I think I'm actually going to give her some constitution. Let's go weakness, because I want to eventually get paralyzed and mass paralysis. Trap. So simple to see, really. Where? Oh. Wish we didn't have to kill the dogs, but... Looks like they aren't giving us that much choice. All right. Oh, stuff for Doge. Get a few items for him, actually. Yeah, you know, potentially a new collar. Ooh. Armor penetration and armor? I think I'll take that. Cold resist and electrical resist. I'll keep them around for now, but I'm not going to worry about it too much. And of course, we got to give him the lamb bone. I know he's already, like, at max affection, but I have to give him the lamb bone? Oh, there's the trap I saw. There we go. All right. Let's check out these last two rooms here first. Ooh. Oh, look! It wants to fight! Make her! Yes. Well, who wants to bet there's something behind this door? Oh! It's you! Please! Don't hurt me! Calm down! I'm not gonna hurt you! I... I'm sorry. I'm so frightened. These monsters are everywhere. My... My name's Valena. The Arlesa's maid. I, is she... All right. What happened to everyone? Valena, The smith's daughter? You know my father. I want to go back to the village. Is there a way out of here? There's a tunnel leading out in the dungeon. But, but the monsters... 
I've killed most of them. It's safe. I'll find my way. I can run fast, and I know the castle. Thank you. Hopefully, she should make it out just fine. Oh, which way? I guess let's head toward the basement first. doesn't die. Not bad. That one group just... They must have all been concentrating on at least Alistair or Liliana, and I just didn't realize it. See if we can go downstairs yet. We can. Is there anything for us down here? And I'm off. Huh. Another love letter? Here we go. My darling Reginald, I burn for you, and because of you. Please use the enclosed tincture if our love is to endure. Sorry. <laughs> Great. <laughs> we got another exit. Goes to the courtyard. Okay, that will also lead back into the castle. A tree for Doge. Very good. Oh, oh, my God, that's a revenue. That's not great. Yeah, whoever that Revenant ends up on, which right now is Alistair, uh, is gonna be hurting. Your health poultice as well. Okay. Oh god. Don't die. Please don't die. Liliana is just getting swarmed over here. Get her to take one more poultice, probably. like, oh, Sir Perth is here. Let's level up Liliana, then we'll talk to him. All is well? 
Yeah, let's give her a critical shot. Sir Perth! Let's let you in. Hey. You have opened the gates. That is good. My men and I are eager to see our Arl again. Shall we enter the main hall together? It must be held if we are to regain control of the castle. Let me look around first. As you wish. We will hold the gate and watch for anyone attempting to leave. Let me know if the situation changes. Like, I know this probably just leads straight into the main hall. But I want to make sure I kill everything and whatnot before I go anywhere with the knights. Yeah, there's Bantigan. That must be the main hall, then. So these are our visitors. The ones you told me about, Mother. Y yes Connor. And this is the one who defeated my soldiers. The ones I sent to reclaim my village. Yes. And now it's staring at me. What is it, mother? I can't see it well enough. This... This is a woman, Connor. Just as I am. You lie! This woman is nothing at all like you. Why, just look at her. Half your age. And pretty, too. I'm surprised you don't order her executed in a fit of jealousy. Connor, I beg you, don't hurt anyone. Ma mother Ma What's happening? Where am I? Oh, thank the Maker. Connor, Connor, can you hear me? Get away from me, fool woman. You are beginning to bore me. Grey Warden. Please don't hurt my son. He is not responsible for what he does. What did you do with Bantigan? Here I am. Here am I. <laughs> I like him better this way. <laughs> no more yelling. Now he amuses me. <laughs> Connor didn't mean to do this. It was that mage, the one who poisoned Demon. He started all this. He summoned this demon. Connor was just trying to help his father. And made a deal with the demon to do so? Foolish child. It was a fair deal. Father is a liar. Just as I wanted. Now it's my turn to sit on the throne and send out armies to conquer the world. Nobody tells me what to do anymore. Nobody tells him what to do. Nobody! Ha 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 ha! Quiet, Uncle! I warned you what would happen if you kept shouting, didn't I? Yes, I did. But let's keep things civil. This woman will have the audience she seeks. Tell us, woman, what have you come here for? I came here to help, if I could. To help me? To help father? To help yourself? Which? Am I truthful, or do I try to placate him? He's not stupid. To help the Arl, of course. So you're a concerned well-wisher. Why didn't you say that in the first place? All the sneaking around and killing is so unnecessary. But father is so very ill. We really shouldn't disturb him. Isn't that right, mother? I... I don't think... Of course you don't. Ever since you sent the knights away, you do nothing but deprive me of my fun. Frankly, it's getting dull. I crave excitement and action. This woman spoiled my sport by saving that stupid village. And now, she'll repay me. 
time for more practice. Hopefully we can get through this without having to use too much healing. Though, I'm gonna go ahead and do one for Alistair. Tegan! Oh, Tegan! Are you alright? I am... Better now, I think. My mind is my own again. Blessed Andraste. I would never have forgiven myself had you died. Not after I brought you here. What a fool I am. Please. Connor's not responsible for this. There must be some way we can save him. You knew about this all along. I... Yes. I didn't tell you because I believed we could help him. I still do. I'm sorry, my lady, but Connor has become an abomination. He's no longer your son. You! You did this to Connor! I didn't. I didn't summon any demon. I told you. Please, if you'll let me help. Help? You betrayed me! I brought you here to help my son, and in return you poisoned my husband? This is the mage you spoke of? Didn't you say he was in the dungeon? He was. I assumed the creatures had killed him by now. He must have been set free. That's right. And I stand by my decision. I know what you must think of me, my lady. I took advantage of your fear. I'm sorry. I never knew it would come to this. Well, I shan't turn away his help. Not yet. And if Connor is truly an abomination... He's not always the demon you saw. Connor is still inside him, and sometimes he breaks through. Please, I just want to protect him. Isn't that what started this? You hired the mage to teach Connor in secret, to protect him. If they discovered Connor had magic, then they'd take him away. I thought if he learned just enough to hide it, then... Where is Connor now? Why did he run? I think he ran upstairs, to the family quarters. Violence scares him. I, I know that sounds strange. He may have run up to his room, or... Or he might be waiting in ambush. I don't know. The fighting may have scared Connor into... coming out again, and so he ran. So you're saying he may be vulnerable? I... perhaps. Is there... Is there no other way? Where is Arl Eamon? Upstairs in his room. I think the demon has been keeping him alive. So if we destroy the demon, then... Then my husband may perish. Yes. So you had no idea the man you hired was an assassin? None. I trusted Loghain. Why wouldn't I? How could I have suspected the mage he sent would be a murderer? And Eamon knew nothing of your plans. Do you not realize what you've done, Isold? Eamon would only demand we do the right thing. I was not going to lose my son. Not to... to magic. And now you may lose him anyway. And so much more. No. No, please. There must be another way. There must be something we can do. Jowen, what can you add to this discussion? The demon in Connor needs to be destroyed. Killing Connor is the easiest way to do that, certainly. But there is another way. A mage could confront the demon in the Fade without hurting Connor himself. What do you mean? Is the demon not within Connor? Not physically. The demon approached Connor in the Fade while he dreamt, and controls him from there. We can use the connection between them to find the demon. You can enter the Fade, then? And kill the demon w without hurting my boy? 
No, but I can enable another mage to do so. It normally requires lyrium and, and several mages, but I have blood magic. Blood magic is forbidden. It's not an option. There's, there's a way. Uh, I must know it. Please, tell us what you mean, Jawan. Lyrium provides the power for the ritual, but I can take that power from someone's life energy. This ritual requires a lot of it, however. All of it, in fact. So, someone must die? Someone must be sacrificed? Yes, and then we send another mage into the Fade. I can't enter because I'm doing the ritual. Maybe I shouldn't have said anything. It's not much of an option. Is there no other method? The power has to come from somewhere, and that means either lyrium or blood. Then let it be my blood. I will be the sacrifice. What? Isolde, are you mad? Eamon would never allow this. Either someone kills my son to destroy that thing inside him, or I give my life so my son can live. To me, the answer is clear. Blood magic. How can more evil be of any help here? Two wrongs don't make a right. It does seem like a sensible choice, with a willing participant. Connor is blameless in this. He should not have to pay the price. It... Uh, it's up to you, my friend. You know more about such things than I do, and it's your companion going into the Fade. The decision is yours. There must be another way to enter the Fade. You can find Lyrium and more mages at the Circle of Magi, if they would even do it. Circle Tower is not far from here. That is an excellent point. One of the treaties is also for the Circle of Magi, after all. The tower is about a day's journey across the lake. You could attempt to get the Mage's help. But what will happen here? Connor will not remain passive forever. I'll take that chance. Very well. I will keep Jowan here as a precaution. He says he wants to help, so he will keep an eye on Connor with us. Go to the tower quickly, then. The longer you are away, the greater the chances of disaster. Well, we won't head upstairs in case we run into Connor. But we will make sure we've checked out all the rooms on this floor. Okay, that leads up. Oh, wow! Keep Alistair alive. Keep me alive too. Oh, Alistair went down when I wasn't looking. Great. That's going to happen a lot until we get his stats in order. I don't know why, like, he's sword and board, and for some reason they just, like, didn't give him con. Yes. It doesn't make any sense. A lot of people won't run with him because of that, because it's kind of annoying, at least at first. God, Liliana. Ready. Okay. See what injury you have. Ah, uh, attack speed. That's that's not great. Well. We'll heal you up, Alistair. You should be fine now. I can level up. 
I think we'll choose our specialization here. We're gonna go duelist. Let's go with repost. See what we can grab out of here. All right. And now Alistair has a level up as well. Doing all right. I think for a while we're probably going to do two con, one strength, just to get his health up at all. Okay, he has all of his combat training. Let's now go tactics. That'll let us have another slot for his, uh, like, AI. Uh, we're gonna need 20 decks for some of these. I'll have to remember that. I don't think I'm gonna reverse it now. I think I have to go shield defense with him, too. And what's in here? We got a book. All right. And a desk. <gasps> Alistair's mom's amulet. Can I give that to him now? This, this is my mother's amulet. It has to be. But why isn't it broken? Where did you find it? I found it in Redcliffe Castle, in the study. In this very room we're standing in, Alistair. You watched me pick it up a second ago. Oh, the Arl study? Then he must have found the amulet after I threw it at the wall. And he repaired it and kept it. I don't understand. Why would he do that? Maybe he meant to give it back to you. Maybe he did. He might even have brought it with him one of those times he came to see me at the monastery. Not that I would have given him a chance, as belligerent as I was to him. Thank you. I mean it. I thought I'd lost this to my own stupidity. I'll need to talk to him about this if he recovers from his... When he recovers, that is. I wish I'd had this a long time ago. Did you remember me mentioning it? Wow. Huh. I'm more used to people not really listening when I go on about things. That's kind of sad. But... I do like joshing with Alistair. Sorry, did you say something? Ho, ho, ho. See this gesture I'm making? Can you hear that? <laughs> oh, good. He gets more con. Excellent. Right, not gonna go upstairs. Don't want to provoke the demon child. See, that's why I'm not having kids. What if they turn into a demon? What are you gonna do then? Okay, well, let's stop at camp and then we will head on to the Circle of Magi, I think. Oh, we have some refugees and whatnot. That they're near some other things. I don't understand. You look like a woman. Um, yes. I am a woman. You are a Grey Warden, so it follows that you can't be a woman. That doesn't make any sense, Sten. So you understand my confusion, then? Not... Precisely, no. Women are priests, artisans, shopkeepers, or farmers. They don't fight. That's not a universal truth. Some women fight. Why would women ever wish to be men? That makes no sense. They don't wish to be men. They wish to be women who fight. Do they also wish to live on the moon? That's as attainable. I'm a woman. And now I'm fighting. One of those things can't be true. A person is born, Gunari or human or elven or dwarf. He doesn't choose that. The size of his hands, whether he is clever or foolish, 
the land he comes from, the color of his hair, these are beyond his control. We do not choose, we simply are. But a person can choose what to do. Can they? We'll see. Well, that gives you a little bit of insight into uh, Kunari culture there. You know, while we're at camp, let's just make sure no one has anything new to say. That will probably take up the rest of our time. Something on your mind? Ooh. We're starting to get into romanceable. I admit, I have a soft spot for Alistair. I think I've done one playthrough where I didn't romance him. Ever. And I believe I said when I started this, I had about 200 hours in the game. So probably like 170 of them are with Alistair at my side. So we're not going to break the trend now. Has anyone ever told you how handsome you are? Not unless they were asking me for a favor. Well, there was that one time in Denerim, but those women were <laughs> not like you. Why? Is this your way of telling me you think I'm handsome? My lips are sealed. Oh, I get it. I'll get it out of you yet. So, is this the part where I get to say the same? That would be nice. Oh, well, <laughs> I'll think about it then. Sometime soon, I'm sure. Ah, uh, Alistair. So, all this time we've spent together, you know, the tragedy, the brushes with death, the constant battles with the whole blight looming over us. Will you miss it once it's over? Miss the constant battles or miss you? I know it might sound strange, considering we haven't known each other for very long, but I've come to care for you. A great deal. I think maybe it's because we've gone through so much together. I, I don't know. Or maybe I'm imagining it. Maybe I'm fooling myself. Am I? Fooling myself? Or do you think you might ever feel the same way about me? I think I already do. So I fooled you, did I? Good to know. Ah. I don't know. I need more testing to be sure. Well, I'll have to arrange that then, won't I? Make his breath, but you're beautiful. I am a lucky man. Now, <clears throat> let's get back to what we were up to before, lest I forget why we're here. He is rather adorable. In a you goofy way. My command. Uh, let's see if he has any new questions. Of course. Can you train others to be a Templar? Others, yes, but not yourself. I need someone who's trained first as a warrior. It's as much about discipline as anything. I guess if I'm going to give up Chantry secrets, I may as well go all the way. Send whoever you want trained to me in camp, and I'll see what I can do. Okay, excellent. Your desire is my command. Why did you keep your birthright a secret? You never ask? That's a cheap answer. <sighs> All right. If you want the full explanation, I'll give it to you. The thing is, I'm used to not telling anyone who didn't already know. It was always a secret. Even Duncan was the only Grey Warden who knew. And then after the battle, when I should have told you, I don't know, it seemed like it was too late by then. How do you just tell someone that? How about... By the way, I'm the heir to the throne. Yes, well, I suppose part of me kind of liked you not knowing. Why? What happens when people find out? They treat me differently. I become the bastard prince to them instead of just Alistair. I know that must sound stupid to you, but I hate that it shaped my entire life. I never wanted it. And I certainly don't want to be king. The very idea of it terrifies me. 
doesn't sound stupid at all. For all the good it does me, my blood seems certain to haunt me no matter what I do. I guess I should be thankful that Arl Eamon is far more likely to inherit the throne. If he's all right. Oh, I hope he's all right. For what it's worth, I'm sorry for not telling you sooner. I... I guess I was just hoping that you would like me for who I am. It was a dumb thing to do. Don't worry about it, Alistair. No harm done. I guess it's kind of a relief that you know now. Let's go. What changes about you after the joining? You mean other than becoming a Grey Warden? You've been a Grey Warden longer than I have. Hmm. You know, I asked Duncan this too. And all I got was, you'll see. He wouldn't tell you? Oh, it's not that Duncan wants to keep it a secret. It's just that the Grey Wardens don't discuss it much. I gather it's not a pleasant topic. The first change I noticed was an increase in appetite. I used to get up in the middle of the night and raid the castle larder. I thought I was starving. I'd slurp down every dinner like it was my last. <laughs> my face all covered in gravy. When I'd look up, the other Grey Wardens would stare, then laugh themselves to tears. I haven't felt anything like that. Really? Because I was watching you wolf down food the other day, and I thought, ooh, it's a good thing she gets a lot of exercise. What can I say? I'm a growing girl. I'll say. Uh, oh, I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> um, no, don't hit me. I bruise easily. Oh, and then there were the nightmares. Duncan said it was part of how we sense the darkspawn. We tap into their... Well, I don't know what you call it. Their group mind. And when we sleep, it's even worse. You learn to block it out after a while, but at first it's hard. It's supposed to be worse for those who join during a blight. How is it for you? Nightmares. Yeah, I know what you mean. Some people never have much trouble, but that's rare. Others have trouble sleeping their entire life. They're just more sensitive, I suppose. Everyone ends up the same, though. Once you reach a certain age, the real nightmares come. That's how a Grey Warden knows his time has come. His time has come? Oh, that's right. We never had time to tell you that part, did we? Well, in addition to all the other wonderful things about being a Grey Warden, you don't need to worry about dying from old age. You've got 30 years to live. Give or take. The taint. It's a death sentence. Ultimately, your body won't be able to take it. When the time comes, most Grey Wardens go to Orzammar and die in battle rather than waiting. It's tradition. Why Orzammar? You'll always find Darkspawn down where the Dwarves are. The oldest Grey Wardens head to the Deep Roads for one last glorious battle. Not that there's a shortage of Darkspawn during a Blight, but that's the tradition. The Dwarves respect us for it. And you wondered why we kept the joining a secret from the new recruits. Well, there you have it. Seems a high price to pay. I suppose it is. We're the only ones who can stop the Blight, however. Is there a price too high to pay for that? You know, Duncan... He started having the nightmares again. He told me that in private. He said it wouldn't be long before he'd go to Orzammar himself. I guess he got what he wanted. I just wish it had been something worthy of him. He will be remembered, Alistair. As will the others. I know. Ending the Blight should make this all worthwhile, right? What was it like to be the Grey Warden, with all the others? I didn't know them for very long. But I guess it was longer than you. You never met them all, did you? They were quite a group. Actually, they felt like an extended family, since we were all cut off from our former lives. We also laughed more than you'd think. There was this one time... Well, you probably don't want to hear stories about men you didn't know. No, I'd like to hear about them. There was one Grey Warden who came all the way from the Anderfels. What was his name? Gregor... Gregor... He was a burly man with the biggest, fuzziest beard you've ever seen. And the man could drink. He drank all the time, but he never got drunk. 
Finally, we all made a pool to see just how many pints it would take to put him under the table. Sounds like you had a lot of fun. Sometimes. We were kin of a sort. All of us had gone through the joining, so we knew... Well, anyhow, it doesn't have to be deadly serious all the time. Anyhow, we never did find out. He said he'd drink a pint for every half pint that the rest of us drank. He was still going by the time the rest of us were passed out. <laughs> I'm told that Duncan walked in later on and saw us all passed out from one end of the hall to the other, and Gregor still drinking. <laughs> Duncan laughed until he nearly... until... A lot of people have died, Alistair. And a lot more will. Yes, I... I suppose so. I thought I was done with this, but... It just struck me that I have nothing to remember Duncan by. Nothing at all. There's no body, not even a token of his that I could... take with me. That must sound really stupid to you. Not at all. I just would have liked something of his to take with me, that's all. Well, there's no use in moaning about it, is there? He's gone. Let's just go. Oh, poor Alistair. I'm wondering something. I'd like to know your thoughts about some of our traveling companions. Do you mind if I ask? Time for the juicy gossip, I take it? I've got this nefarious plan to go around to each of them and secretly tell them all the nasty things you said. That way they'll mutiny and I shall become the group leader. <laughs> if you want to lead, all you have to do is ask. What? Lead? Me? No, 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 no leading. Bad things happen when I lead. We get lost. People die. And the next thing you know, I'm stranded somewhere. Without any pants. Seriously, though, I'm only curious. I've had enough time to form my own opinions, and I just want to see if yours are any different. Only if you tell me your opinion as well. Just try and stop me. Let's see, where should I begin? What about Sten? The way he looks at me with those eyes. Creepy. And he's so quiet for someone so big. He's dedicated. I'll give him that. Yet he doesn't seem quite so bad as the Chantry tells us. According to them, his philosophy is vile and evil. Yet he seems so reasonable. And yet, he killed all those people. He doesn't even deny it. Doesn't that bother you? He seems to regret what he did. Hmm. I'm not so sure that his regret means the same as it would for us. The Kunari sense of honor is... It's a bit hard to grasp. For me, anyway. What about Liliana? Is she crazy? Or do you really believe in her vision? It could be true. Who's to say it isn't? Maybe you're right. It's not as if she could have known that we needed help so desperately, after all. Yet, there she was. I don't know what to make of her. If you look at her when she doesn't see you, she just looks so... so sad. I almost feel guilty taking her away from her life. It was her choice. Yes, I know. Still, I feel badly for her. Morrigan, do you trust her? Think about it. Maybe Flemeth sent her with us for some other reason than she said. You really don't like each other, do you? Well, aside from the fact that she's a complete and utter bitch. <gasps> no, Alistair. I don't like her at all. Why, do you? I don't have to like her. She's useful. That's the most sensible thing I've heard out of you yet. Just remember that she's dangerous too. And evil. And mean. Enough. I think my curiosity is sated. Let's get back to it, shall we? If you were raised in the Chantry, have you never... Never... Never what? Had a good pair of shoes? You know what I mean. I'm not sure I do. Have I never seen a basilisk? Ate jellied ham? Have I never licked a lamppost in winter? Now you're making fun of me. Make fun of you, dear lady. Perish the thought. Well, tell me. 
Have you ever licked a lamppost in winter? That's not what I meant, and you know it. Oh, so that's what we're talking about. I admit I've never had a woman just come out and ask me like this, that's for sure. I myself never had the pleasure. Not that I haven't thought about it, of course. But, you know. Two is just, two is tempting, but I can't remember how he takes that one. <laughs> uh, we're going to risk it for the biscuit. Oh, I see. You lack the proper parts. Oh, that's funny. Such cruelty from such a beautiful woman. If you hear sobbing later, that's me crying myself to sleep. You think I'm beautiful? Of course you are, and you know it. You're ravishing, resourceful, and all those other things you probably hurt me for not saying. So glad you remembered. Let us be off then. <laughs> Lest your risque talk make my ears blush. Let's see what he has for some private topics of discussion. Well, we're in camp. Now's as good a time as any to talk, right? I need to tell you how much I enjoy your company. You know, I was just thinking the same thing. <laughs> Given the circumstances, things could have been so much worse. I'm so grateful that you're you, instead of some other Grey Warden. Mm, that sounded better in my head. I, I just mean to say that I've really come to care about you. I feel the same way. Now we just need to be rid of that pesky archdemon and everything will be back to normal, right? <laughs> So, how would you like to join me in my tent? Join you? In your tent? If you don't want to. Oh, that's not it at all. Not that I want to seem over-eager. <clears throat> I must sound like a fool. You know that I've never done anything like this with anyone. I was quite sheltered after all. I care for you so much. Whenever I think of this, I, I feel like a bumbling idiot. All hands. I wish I could be better at this. I want it to be right. He is kind of adorable. But I think this is as right as it gets. With the dark spawn on our heels, death awaiting us at every turn? Sure, why not? Hot. <laughs> I don't know. I'm willing to give it a shot, if... You are. Yes, I'm willing. Right. I'm going to stop talking now. Hmm. You know, according to all the sisters at the monastery, I should have been struck by lightning by now. It could still happen. <laughs> sure. But if you get hit by the lightning afterwards, it hardly seems like an effective deterrent. You do realize the rest of our little party here is going to talk, right? They do that. First smart comment, and I feed him to the dark spawn. <laughs> See? This is why I love you. So, what now? Where do we go from here? We stay together, no matter what happens. Right, I can handle that, I hope. Before we go, I just want to thank you. No one's ever made me feel this way. I wasn't sure it could happen, in fact. You don't need to thank me. I did, actually, but let's get moving. Okay, that's all the new dialogue for Alistair. Let's talk to Liliana. I... Have I ever told you I really like the way you wear your hair? Which is kind of funny because we have incredibly similar hairstyles. <laughs> My hair? Thank you. It's very nice and it suits you. Simple. Not like the elaborate hairstyles we wore in Orle. They involved flowers, ribbons, jewels, one year. Feathers were all the rage, and Lady Elise decided she needed to outdo everyone else, and actually wore live songbirds in her voluminous hair. The chirping was quite charming for a while, but you must realize, terrified little birdies often have loose bowels. Poor birds. Yes, 
I don't envy them. She never washed her hair. But I was trying to say something nice to you, wasn't I? Oh, forgive me. My mind wanders so. It's just that I... I feel so comfortable talking to you. Like I could say anything and you wouldn't judge me. Wouldn't I? Maybe I just keep it to myself. Aha! You see? You play along with me. Not many will do that. I haven't felt this close to anyone in a long time. I really enjoy your company. You're a treasured friend, Liliana. Thank you. I am honored that you feel that way. If I were doing a, a different kind of playthrough, that would have been where her romance would have started. Why did you decide to come to Ferelden? My mother was from Denerim, and I consider myself a Ferelden. Mother served an Orlesian noblewoman who lived here when Orle ruled. When Orle was defeated and the common folk began to resent the presence of any Orlesian, the lady returned to Orle. She took my mother with her. I was born in Orle and did not set foot in Ferelden till much later. Mother was always telling me stories of her homeland. I think she missed it. Was she not happy in Orle? She wasn't unhappy. We had a good life, and she liked Orle well enough. I loved it, though. Valroyeux was so vibrant, colorful. Mother died when I was very young. Lady Cecily let me stay with her. I had no one else. She was quite old then, and she had me study music and dance to entertain her. It is unfair that I have more memories of Cecily than my mother. What was Cecily like? She was an elderly lady, very refined and proper. She had impeccable manners and taste, more so than a lot of Olesian ladies. Cecily was also kind. My mother was unmarried and with child. It was scandalous, and Cecily had every right to turn my mother out. She didn't. Strangely, the only thing I really remember of mother was her scent. She kept dry flowers in her closet amongst her clothes. Small white Ferelden wildflowers with a sweet fragrance. Mother called them Andraste's Grace. They were very rare in Orle. But enough about that. Let us move on. And we actually picked some of those up. There we go, Andraste's Grace. Mmm, flowers? Oh, uh, thank you. They're very pretty. These are your mother's flowers, aren't they? These were her favorite. <sighs> I haven't seen these in such a long time. They smell just like mother used to. Thank you. Thank you so much for remembering. Do you miss anything about Arle? I miss Valroyau. Unlike other cities where the people are the lifeblood and the character, Valroyau was her own person, and her people little more than decorations. There was always music in Valroyau, streaming from the many windows, quiet refrains and triumphant choruses. And always, floating above that all, the chant, coming from the Grand Cathedral. It was magnificent. I've never been to Orle. If you get the chance, you should see it, at least Valroyau. Of course, there are good things and bad things about Orle, like anywhere else. Sometimes, I miss it dearly, and sometimes, I'm glad I'm rid of it. And you will laugh at this, but I miss the fine things I had in Orle. Must have been a big change, moving to Lotharin. I left behind much, leaving Orle. But there is more to life than dresses and furs. It is sad that many have lost sight of this. Orle is very fashionable. Almost ridiculously so. <gasps> but the shoes! Living with those ridiculous trends was worth it for the shoes. Were they ridiculous shoes? Sometimes. About ten years ago, all the ladies went mad for shoes with soles as large and heavy as bricks. But it isn't always that silly. When I left Orle, the fashion was shoes with delicate tapered heels and embellishments in the front. A ribbon, perhaps, or embroidery. In soft colors, of course. It was spring. Oh, that sounds lovely. I had my eye on a pair my shoemaker was working on. It was covered in pale blue silk with amber beads on the toe. The shoes made in Orle were exquisite. Not at all like these clunky fur-lined leather boots you have in Ferelden. Ugh, just look at them. At least they keep the cold out. They're sturdy shoes, but sometimes a girl just wants to have pretty feet. Oh, I could talk about shoes all day. 
But we have things to do, don't we? Do I have a pair of shoes? I do! Oh, how dear of you! Thank you so much! Okay, that's just a normal gift. Oh, but it did up her cunning. I heard that in Orlay, minstrels are often spies. Why did you hear this? Who cares? Is it true or not? Not all minstrels are spies. Most are just singers and storytellers, but some of them are... are what we call bards. What's the difference? Many use the two words, minstrel and bard, interchangeably, but to do so in Orlais would cause misunderstanding. Bards are minstrels and more. Spies, as you say. Some say there is a bard order, but I don't think this is true. Many bards work alone or in small groups, doing the bidding of a patron who pays for their services. If there is an organization behind it all, no one knows who they are. Patron? What sort of patron? Nobles, mostly. In Orlais, there is much rivalry amongst the highborn. They fight over land, influence, and the favor of the empress. But they cannot do this openly because it is impolite, and in public, they wear smiling faces and pretend to be civil. In secret, they plot and scheme to destroy each other. It is a game completely meaningless to anyone but its players. You seem to know quite a bit about these bards. <laughs> and I should, shouldn't I, after having spent most of my adult life as one. You've guessed as much, I'm sure. But does it really matter what I was? What's past is past. But why were you living as a cloistered sister in rural Ferelden? I found myself in Ferelden and sheltered from bad weather in the Chantry. And when the storm passed, I just did not want to leave. I like to say the Maker brought me here. Can you teach me to be a bard? Mm, that's an idea. I've watched you, and I do think you'd find some of my skills quite easy to pick up. Let's just go over there, away from the others. For safety, yes? I expect there shall be daggers flying about willy-nilly for a time. I've heard some rumors about Orlesian spies. There are many rumors about spies, Orlesian or otherwise. What are you referring to exactly? They say you will do almost anything to achieve your goals. I admit I have done many despicable things in my lifetime. I do what I have to do. So do you. So does everybody. Sometimes we must do terrible things to get what we want. If it is any consolation, I always try to use non-violent means to achieve my ends. It often takes more effort, though. Some bards rely on torture to get what they want. It works effectively, as many will bend under the threat of bodily harm. But there are better ways, more subtle and kind. You will be surprised how easily a person will open up to you, even if all you offer is a listening ear. People respond eagerly to others who they believe understand them. They seek approval, friendship, sometimes love. This can be exploited. Good to know. It is a game, one that can be won with little bloodshed if one plays well. You thought it was a game? Isn't it? Everyone can be seduced by the right woman. The trick is predicting who she is and becoming her. Master the game and no one can resist you. And would you say you've mastered this game? If I might be so bold, yes. I was quite good at it. Sometimes, all I had to do was toss a glance and a smile. Men read promises into such things and will go to great lengths to see that promise fulfilled. Maybe you could smile at the blight and tell it to go away. I could... what? Oh, aren't you funny? I see your point. <laughs> we will slay this darkspawn using conventional means, pointy sticks and all that. But come, it is getting late and there is much to be done. This recording is pretty much at a good length right now. So I think what I'll do is I'll read a few codex entries here. We'll pick up with Sten and Morrigan, and then I'll do my shopping. 
uh, in the next episode. So let's see what we have to read. The Ballad of Aisley. The wind that stirs their shallow graves carries their song across the sands. Heed our words, hear our cry. The gray are sworn, in peace we lie. Heed our words, hear our cry. Our names were called, we cannot die. When darkness comes and swallows light, heed our words, and we shall rise. From the Ballad of Aisley, said to have been written after the Battle of Aisley, which ended the Fourth Blight, 520 Exalted. The Legend of Kalanhad, Chapter 1. Prior to the crowning of King Kalanhad, Ferelden was little more than a collection of independent Arlings and Tyrners that warred on each other constantly over petty matters. Kalanhad was born in 510 Exalted as the third son of a High Ever merchant on hard times. He was eventually sent to a distant cousin, a poor young knight named Sir Fornan, who made Kalanhad his squire and dog handler. As the tale goes, Sir Fornan and his squire became caught up in one of the wars of unity at the time. Arl Merlin was a strong but generally disliked man who was making a bid for kingship. Forenan's own lord, a young fool of an Arl named Tenador, no older than Kalanhad, was besieged by Merlin's forces at his castle, today known as West Hill. When Merlin called Tenador out to parley, the young Arl asked for a volunteer from among the squires, someone who could masquerade as Tenador in the parley party. Callan had kneeled before Tenador and asked for the honor. Much to Tenador's and Sir Forenan's dismay, Callan had immediately identified himself to Arl Merlin. When asked by the Arl why he was here, Callan had explained that he had been asked to take the place of his lord. The Arl said that he had planned to kill Tenador. Was Callan had willing to die in his lord's place as well? Callan had impressed Merlin and his allies by saying that he was. Merlin offered Callan had a place as his own squire, but Callan had refused, stating that if Merlin had planned on betraying the right of Parley, he was no man of honor. Merlin's allies laughed at that, and Merlin himself conceded that Callan had had a point. He allowed Callan had to return to the castle safely and launched his final assault. During the assault, both Tenador and Forenan were killed, but Callan had found himself in one-on-one -on -one combat with Arl Merlin. In front of all of Merlin's allies, Callan had defeated the Arl and commanded he call off his armies. The Arl asked Callan had who he professed to serve now, if both his knight and his lord were dead, to which Callan had replied that he would do as his honor bade him to, for he had nothing else. You are not a man known for your honor, Callan had said, but I believe you wish to be. You allowed me to live once, and so now I do the same for you. Perhaps if more of our people lived by honor, we would learn to trust each other long enough to live together. And with that, Callan had withdrew his sword. I am humbled by your words, Arl Merlin told Callan had, dropping to one knee. To his allies, he shouted that he now knew he would never be king but he knew who should be. With that, Merlin pledged allegiance to Kalanhad, whom he named Tyrn and ruler of Tenador's lands. From the Legend of Kalanhad, by Brother Heron, Chanty Scribe, 810 Blessed. The History of the Chantry, Chapter 2. When the prophet Andraste and her husband Maferath arrived at the head of their barbarian horde, Southern Tevinter was thrown into chaos. The Imperium had defended against invasions in the past, but now they stood without the protection of their gods, with their army in tatters and their country devastated by the blight. Many felt that the timing of the invasion was yet another of the Maker's miracles in Andraste's campaign to spread his divine word. Andraste was more than simply the wife of a warlord, after all. She was also the betrothed of the Maker. Enraptured by the melodic sound of her voice as she sang to the heavens for guidance, the Maker himself appeared to Andraste and proposed that she come with him, leaving behind the flawed world of humanity. In her wisdom, 
Andraste pleaded with the Maker to return to his people and create paradise in the world of men. The Maker agreed, but only if all of the world would turn away from the worship of false gods and accept the Maker's divine commandments. Armed with the knowledge of the one true god, Andraste began the exalted march into the weakened Imperium. One of the Maker's commandments, that magic should serve man rather than rule over him, was as honey to the souls of the downtrodden of Tevinter, who lived under the thumbs of the Magisters. Word of Andraste's exalted march, of her miracles and military successes, spread far and wide. Those in the Imperium who felt the old gods had abandoned them eagerly listened to the words of the Maker. Those throngs of restless citizens that destroyed temples now did so in the name of the Maker and his prophet Andraste. As Mafarath's armies conquered the lands of southern Tevinter, so did Andraste's words conquer hearts. It is said that the Maker smiled on the world at the Battle of Valerian Fields, in which the forces of Mafarath challenged and defeated the greatest army Tevinter could muster. The southern reaches of the mighty Imperium now lay at the mercy of barbarians. Faith in the Maker, bolstered by such miracles, threatened to shake the foundations of the Imperium apart. Of course, the human heart is more powerful than the greatest weapon, and when wounded, it is capable of the blackest of deeds. From Tales of the Destruction of Thetis by Brother Genitivi, Chantry Scholar. We'll end with Cautionary Tales for the Adventurous. It was then that he realized he wasn't alone. The abandoned camp in front of him was unbelievably welcoming, like a mirage. The fire felt like a warm hand grabbing his heart. It reminded him of a previous life, so long ago, when he was happy. Running on the sunflower fields with his boy, the sun on his face, laying next to the fireplace with his beautiful wife in his arms. He felt a sharp pain in his heart. His thoughts shifted to that fateful day when everything changed. Blood was everywhere. He held the body of his dead wife in his arms. Around him, the ashes of his burned house felt like snow. The stench was terrible. It smelled like darkspawn. He grabbed his axe, touched the icy cold hands of his boy, and left. He would kill them. He would kill them all. The pain in his heart was unbearable. He opened his eyes and saw the second most terrifying thing he would see in his life. A shadowy wraith leaning over him, leeching his wife away. Around him, the camp was gone, replaced by something familiar, almost peaceful. Bones, death, and despair. He wondered if all his life had been an illusion, if he'd ever had a family. For a brief moment, he felt relief. You can't lose something you've never had. But being this close to death brought clarity. He knew it was real. Everything else was the illusion. You could see a smile on his torn face. He had been waiting for this moment for a long, long time. He lifted his weak arms, grasped the demon's face, and kissed it. It felt like kissing a cloud made of sand and dust. Suddenly, all sorrow left him, and with it, the last bit of life he had. Before his limp body hit the ground, it was all over. He was finally free. From Cautionary Tales for the Adventurous, by Brother Ramos of Gilherm, 794 Storm. All right, that will do for now. When we come back, we'll do a couple more codex entries. We'll talk to some people in camp, and then we're going to go off to find the mages. See you then! <laughs>